being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us, ready to buy, to the number on the screen. Starting pricing for low-end software, $100, and starting pricing for high-end software, $500. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal Buyer's Protection Guarantee. Hey there family, it's your girl Chris Kelly, and I'm here to remind you to grab your ticket to the most anticipated event of this year. The FDA Expo is coming to you in Dallas, Texas, Saturday, May 27th, 2023. There will be incredible workshops from wellness, business, legal, survival, and educational forums with prominent and powerful figures of today as your host. But not only will it be empowering and enlightening, it will also be entertaining with the FBA fashion show showcasing FBA models and designers. Listen, I need all my designers and beautiful models to go to FBAExpo.com and submit your application right now, to my Dallas family, I'm looking to showcase local talent and I'm in need of a poet. So please, visit FBAExpo.com for vendor availability and to purchase tickets to the Expo. Stay tuned for more information and come out and support Black Creation. Get this knowledge. Come see me, come see us, and come have fun. I'll see you there. Boom. All right. There it is. And here I am. I ain't been on with you guys in a few days, man. I'm here. I'm locked and loaded and I'm ready. How y'all doing, family? How y'all living, man? I'm 30 something minutes late. It's been a busy day. It's been a busy week. But I'm here. We're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to chop up some real good game and some good information tonight because I haven't been on with you guys I wasn't on all this week, as a matter of fact, because I was in Maui. Me and the family, we had a vacation because the children were on spring break. So we took the family, the children, my, my wife and my, my, my mother had a family trip out to Maui, had a great time with the family and um, much needed vacation, much greed. Yeah, yeah, green, I got on the green. Yeah, yeah, I, I got on the, the retro green shirt. You know, I was at the museum earlier, you know. Uh, I'm at the museum, and, um, you know, I got on my museum clothes. You know, I got to rock my museum clothes. Yeah, but I'm here. I'm here, ladies and gentlemen. I am here. Ready to chop up some great game like I always do. Yes, I haven't been on all week, so you know so we're going to have to make up for it tonight to chop up some very good games, some good information tonight. Um, glad to have y'all in. Look like I'm just coming from somewhere. Yeah, I was at the museum earlier. Shout out, I uh, was with my brother Mike Daniels, NFL great. Uh, my brother Mike Daniels, him and his family came down. Um, shout out to brother, brother Mike. I fell in love with his mother and father. His mom and dad were there. Good old school FBA family, man. Was chopping up game with them. We had a phenomenal time with them today. Um, and we're here. We're here. A lot of stuff going on. And again, I, 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 I hate that I missed chopping up game with the family this week. Um, shout out to everybody in Maui. I, I ran into some, some FBA brothers and sisters living in Maui. Yeah. Um, shout out to L.A. Nick, brother Nick out there, him and his wife, him and his queen. It was a brother living out there in Maui. We saw them at our hotel. Um, good brother and sister, and they gave us all types of products. His, his queen makes these body butter products that smell real good. Uh, brother Nick was looking out for us big time. Um, Nick hit me up. He was like, hey, man, I wanna, I gotta, I'm going to drop off a little package for you and the family before um, y'all roll out. He said, you got to try these Hawaiian butter biscuits. They got like a, a Hawaiian version of butter biscuits. And I'm thinking he's kind of bullshitting. So he dropped off like a little package to us at the hotel. I, I, right before we left, we met up with him and 
it was like some some kind of coconut water that was good as hell fruits and berries and stuff and it was these hawaiian style butter biscuits i don't even know what they were called but man we were he was like yeah take these back to la with you nigga we started eating them bitches in the car nigga that box of hawaiian butter biscuits didn't make it to the airport nigga we polished them bitches off before we got on the flight nigga i don't know what was in them hawaiian butter biscuits i don't know what they were called it's some he said he just said they were hawaiian butter biscuits I don't know what was in these things. These things were on hit. I was like that big old swole nigga who be on YouTube dancing. I was bucking my eyes eating them. All them Hawaiian butter biscuits was on deck. Yeah, that Hawaiian bread is, their bread out there be popping. Boy, that Hawaiian bread, they got like some coconut bread out there that's real good. That Hawaiian bread be on hit. I don't know what was in them Hawaiian butter biscuits, nigga. But I see why that big old swole nigga, that non-FBA nigga be bucking his eyes. If anything that good, <laughs> my eyes bucked a little bit. God damn, them shits was on hit. So, Nick, let me know where you got them Hawaiian butter biscuits from. I can't eat it on camera. I don't want to disappoint the children who look up to me. With my eyes bucking with, with butter biscuit crumbs dripping off my mouth. I don't want to disappoint my the youth. I don't want to set a bad example because they will make you buck your eyes just a little bit. You're like, oh, what the hell is in this? Oh, Jesus. You don't want the kids to see you bucking your eyes. You know, you got to be a good example. Yeah, I don't know what was in that, but I see why that big old swole nigga be bucking his eyes if something is that good. Oh, they were like a sweet taste. They were moist. They were, oh, it was good. All oh, them shits was good. They look, they almost look like cinnamon rolls, but they, there wasn't no cinnamon in them. You know what I'm saying? They almost have a cinnamon roll type of vibe. I, I got to ask Nick what the name of those joints were. I got to ask him what they were because I got to get some more of them joints. So we're in Maui. Maui, I like Maui because, see, we usually go to Oahu. Let me turn my fan on because it's kind of hot in here. But Oahu and Waikiki, that's too, it's too corporate now, man. It's, it doesn't have that local island vibe. So when you go on vacation, man, you want to, you know, kind of feel like you're in another place. Um, Maui still kind of has that local island vibe. Waikiki, it's just like, you know, that's like going to... Um, New Orleans and New York, yeah, you know, you. I don't want to travel all the way out there to eat at um, the Cheesecake Factory. You, you know what I'm saying? A lot of the local spots in Waikiki, they don't really have some of the the mom and pop local spots that we like because those are actually better. So I don't want to go all the way out there to go to a, a, a corporate um, joint to eat. I like the little mom and pop spots at these spots. Yeah. Hawaiian sweet rolls with glaze, yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah, the, no, it wasn't the malasadas. I know what the malasadas are. Yeah, I, I've been to Leonard's. and oh, Man, look, I already know what the malasadas These were not malasadas. They were not that. They were not the malasadas. They were something else. Yeah, they ruined the beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's real. Yeah, Waikiki is lame now, dude. Yeah, the, the last time I went, it was like, yeah. Because there was like a little ramen spot, a little mom and pop ramen spot we used to go to. That wasn't there no more. It's it's not it's not popping. It's just like going to any major city. It's just not popping like that no more. And when you go to Oahu, you got to go way up to the North Shore, hit them food trucks. You got to do stuff like that. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was just saying that. You got to go to North Shore. You got to go all the way up there to really get the vibe and get the flavor. Yeah. But uh, again, I had a great time in um, Hawaii. I, you know, in, in Maui, I had like some coffee the, the day before I left. It was some kind of coffee and the coffee was purple. It was a purple coffee. And I don't know the name of that. So it was off the chain, man. Off the damn chain. Yeah, the ramen spot is gone. So yeah, that, you know. So Maui, if you want to go to Hawaii, I think Maui would be the spot and some of the other smaller islands, you know? Um, somebody, everybody come on in. While people are come on, coming on in, we're going to um, 
talk about the main topic shortly. We're just waiting on everybody to come in. I need you guys to do a favor. Why don't you guys retweet the link to this broadcast right now? Yes, I was at the New Edition concert last night at um, the Forum. Everybody, first of all, hit the like button, hit that thumbs up button, hit the share button, hit that share button, but well, hit the like, hit the subscribe button. Then hit the share button. Share this on your social media. Share this on your um, Twitter page. Share this on your Facebook page. And yes, I was at the um, New Edition concert last night. Shout out to everybody who went there. Great concert. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the concert. The concert was popping. Um, it was um, Tank, Guy, Key Sweat, and New Edition. Great, great concert last night. The, the person who really shined, I think who did the best for me, was Keith Sweat. Keith Sweat represented. I love Keith Sweat. Keith Sweat sounds good. You know, he looks like he's in good shape. Um, great show. Um, phenomenal performer, man. Keith Sweat is a, a legend in the game, man. Our brother doesn't get enough credit. And what I liked about Keith, he was not only he was doing all of his hits, he started showing the, the people some of the songs that he wrote for other people. Keith put a lot of folks on. Keith Sweat put a lot of people on. You think? Know? Yeah, Guy was good. Guy was good. Yeah, but Keith, Keith, you know, sounds good. Um, yeah, Bobby was there. Yeah, Keith was definitely the best. Keith had a phenomenal show. Phenomenal show. Um, and again, he started playing some of the songs that he wrote for Silk and um, Gerald LaBert and um, cut close and just a lot of people. He wrote um, Just Got Paid. He usually does that on his show. Um, just Got Paid by Johnny Kemp. Keith Sweat wrote that song. And then he brought out Teddy to play with him on the on some of the songs. And that was phenomenal. Um, Keith Sweat's background singers was phenomenal. I want to know the, the background singer, the female one. I wonder if that's Athena from Cut Close because she sounds just like her. His background singers are phenomenal. But yeah, Johnny Kemp, that um, Just Got Paid song, Keith Sweat actually wrote that song. Just Got Paid, Friday night, parties jumping. That was, Keith Sweat wrote that song. I don't think he initially got the credit for it because um, Gene Griffin, Gene Griffin was a gangster from Harlem. Gene was basically is saying, you know, he took writing credits and production credits from a lot of songs. So, um, I think there was something going on with Gene Griffin. <laughs> and RIP to Gene Griffin. Gene Griffin died. He died some years back. But Gene Griffin was like an OG gangster in Harlem who was wrecking shit back in the day. Gene Griffin was not a damn joke. He was in there smacking up Andre Harrell. Yeah, a lot of folks don't know. Just Got Paid was written by um, Keith Sweat. He wrote that song. And um, yeah, I think Gene Griffin was just kind of taking the credit for stuff. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? I think that whole thing, remember, it's it's good that New Edition and Guy are on tour because there was a murder back in the day. This is why I, I don't think they've been, they've clicked up with each other before, you know, in all of these years. So this was, a lot of folks don't know back in the day uh, with New Edition and Guy, um, somebody got killed. I want to say from one of their... New Edition and God, their camps were beefing, all right? This was early, 90, late 80s, early 90s. Late 80s, early 90s. Um, some shit was going on with the New Edition guy camp, and I know Gene Griffin, he was in the middle of that, and somebody got killed. Somebody got killed. Was it Bobby Brown's friend? Somebody got killed, and I know Gene Griffin was kind of in the middle of that. You know, it's, the details are, you know, kind of all over the place. And and I've actually met some of the OG dudes who was in that situation. You know, so it's, it's kind of all over the place. But the bottom line, without going into too many details, guy, security guy got taken. Yeah, yeah somebody got killed because of that whole thing. Yeah, and, I, and Gene Griffin was somehow in the middle of that stuff. You know, somebody's bodyguard. Yeah, they showed it in the new edition movie. 
It happened in Pittsburgh. It was Teddy's best friend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and for a long time, Guy and New Edition, they just weren't really rocking with each other like that. You know, they weren't rocking with each other. Yeah, Teddy produced My Prerogative for Bobby Brown. Yeah. So, you know, they were clicked in with Gene Griffin, and Gene Griffin was not nobody to play with back in the day. You know, Gene was, you know, and, and, I, and I say that to say that, again, with the Just Got Paid song, I know Gene Griffin got a writing credit, but he was like, hey, he was just basically housing writing credits. I think Gene Griffin said he wrote, he got, if you look at the My Prerogative credit, Gene Griffin got a writing production credit on My Prerogative. All, he was housing everybody's shit. He was just going in there just housing niggas writing credits. <laughs> if you look at some of those old early New Jack Swing records, you'll see produced and written by Gene Griffin. Yeah. Teddy said Gene stole his publishing. Yeah, Gene was Suge Knight before Suge Knight. <laughs> yeah. Gene Griffin was housing people shit. You know? Yeah, Teddy did, you know, basically that whole album, the Make It Last Forever album, he did production on that whole album. Phenomenal, phenomenal album. You think? But um, it's good to see everybody all working together. The tour is great. Uh, again, T Keith sounded phenomenal. Uh, the new edition, they sounded phenomenal. Bobby, he's doing his thing. And Bobby's still sounding good. Um, Bobby was, you know, he takes breaks. Bobby, you know, visibly you can see that he's not keeping up with a lot of the dance moves like the others, and that's okay. They have to give Bobby breathers, which is which is okay. We're not even tripping on that. Because we know Bobby has had, had some health issues or whatever. So I see I sometimes see people make little TikTok videos like, damn, Bobby can't even keep up with the dance step. Eh, whatever, man. You know, Bobby, that man has had strokes and all types of shit. And the fact that he can get out there and just still do his thing a little bit, I pop my damn collar to Bobby Brown. I'm very proud of that brother, man. Bobby has been through stuff. Bobby has been through a lot. That brother has had losses and trauma in his life, and he's suffered, and he's still coming out shining. So, yeah, my man wants to take a breather. It's all love. He said Bobby's out of shit. It's all right, man. My man has been through some things, and we still love Bobby. Bobby sounds great when he does my prerogative. He still rocks that crowd. Let me tell you something. Whatever. Bobby still rocks that damn crowd, and he's a legend, so we'll, we'll give him a little leeway. Yeah, we'll give Bobby a little leeway. He's still our brother. He's still, he, and he sounds good. You know? But Johnny, yeah, Johnny's a little out of shape. Yeah, Johnny was singing, and Johnny kind of gets, he, he does extra. Did, were y'all at the L.A. show? Johnny kind of slipped a little bit. He jumped up, and he kind of lost his balance a little bit. <laughs> you know, he's kind of, he, he's getting a little tubby. So Johnny was jumping up and, you know, trying to do his thing, and he kind of lost his balance. Like, ma, 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 ma. So, you know, he's, he's all right. You know, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, Bobby's a real cool brother. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Bobby's a cool brother. He's a soldier, man. So I take my hat off to Bobby. I'm very proud of Bobby. And, and Guy, that stuff was good. Um, the thing is with, with Guy, um, and Aaron still, you know, he can still hold a note. Aaron's voice is a little shot, to be honest. Aaron Hall's voice is, is, a, is a tad bit, it's, you know, sound like he's been doing a lot of drinking. See, you can't do all that stuff to your voice. It ain't just old age. Um, how old is Aaron Hall? How old is Aaron? No. Well, Aaron is, what, 60? How old is Aaron Hall? Because you can't, it's not just old age. How old is, let me look up Aaron Hall real quick and see how old Aaron is. Aaron Hall is 58. He's 58. It's not quite 60. It's not, no, no, it sounds like Aaron, Aaron might have been, you know, sounds like years of drinking or whatever, then, then got on his throat a little bit. Smoking, yeah, cause, yeah you can hear it. Because, no, just because you're like, Charlie Wilson is what, 70? And Charlie Wilson, his voice is crisp and clear. Yeah, Aaron is 58. But no, Aaron, he's not sounding like the records anymore because you can, the, the drinking and smoking, that has taken, um, you know, it, it kind of cuts a couple of octaves down on your, your voice. Your voice. Yeah? So he doesn't sound 
you know, he doesn't sound bad, bad, but it's just not, he's not in the same octaves as he used to. It's not as, I love Aaron Hall too. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shitting on Aaron Hall, but you know, it's not the clear, when I get you home tonight, everything will be all right. It ain't that. No more. Like Charlie still sounds like the records from back in the 70s and 80s, Charlie Wilson. But Aaron is like, when I get you home tonight, everything is big. It's, it's, now it's more of a husk. Doesn't have the same clear octave, but he's still on key, and that's good enough. All my love is for you. Yeah. Let's chill. That's chill. So it's kind of that. And also with Aaron, for 58, Aaron is in good shape. For Aaron's 58 years old. He's in good shape for 58. He's in good shape. But the thing is, Aaron, you know, he's still doing the thing where, you know, he's getting on stage and he's taking off your shirt and all that shit. You can, uh, some, some of the shirt taking off days is, you know, that's kind of, Coming to a close, all right? Uh, Aaron has to know that. Aaron, you know, he's still in good shape for a 58-year-old dude. Kind of has a little belly, just a little bit, you, you know. So he's, he's running on stage, taking his shirt off, and it's it's giving starving Somalian a little bit. It's, it's giving hungry Somalian <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so he's, he might have to start keeping the clothes on now, yeah. You know, you're taking off your, your shirt and your little belly sticking out. All my love is for you. No, put your shirt on, brother. Put put a put a put a sweater on or something, brother. <laughs> yeah. Say the aunties love it. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, he has the the dad. He has the granddad bod. You know, it's all right. You're getting the granddad bod. You can't be out there talking about let's chill with the granddad bod now. Is getting a little granddaddish. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like you it's like your 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 granddad trying to be a, be sexy and it's like, okay, grandpa pop, you know, let's let's put your sweater back on. This is not ninety-three, all right? <laughs> So that's what it is. But it was a, nevertheless, it was a great, oh, I'm not doing them dirty. It's not like Jodeci. Now, KC really got to put his shit back on. KC, you, you know, he's, you know, they still acting like it's 94 and KC go rips his shirt off. And, you know, and KC don't understand that that ain't really working no more. That, you know. This ain't 94. You can't just be ripping your clothes off like that. You're scaring the people in the front row at this point. You know, you take off your shirt, your, your, your body is skinny and pudgy, and you got great taco meat, and you're like, ooh, yeah. I'm like, ooh no, nigga. Take, take, come on, take your shirt and put it back on. Whoever you threw the shit off to, to the audience, the audience members are passing the shit back. Here, here. Put that shit back on. <laughs> yeah, it, it looked kind of crazy back in the day. I, no, you say don't speak on another man. Well, look, if I'm at a concert, you know, close to the front row, and I'm in there grooving to some of my '90s songs, and then a motherfucker rip his shirt off, and some of his sweat and must flick over on me in the third row, I'm like, hey, hold on. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, I, I have something to say about that. You done ripped off your shirt and you flung it my way. Now it smells like must and old spice. Hold on, wait a minute. I don't I don't I didn't pay these tickets to see that. I didn't I didn't want to experience that. You know. You didn't ripped off your clothes and it still smells like 93, you know. You done threw your, your musty, sweaty t shirt over me and it smells like obsession cologne. <laughs> and barbecue sauce, and nigga, damn, okay. Put that shit back on. But it was a great concert. We we had a great time. It was a great time at the concert. 
you know, shout out to them, man. The, the, the sold out venue was popping. It was real popping. All right, we've got a lot of folks in here, man. Let's get into the nitty gritty of what we're talking about. Let's get into the nitty gritty. All right. Let's get into the nitty gritty. What we're talking about, guys, we've been hearing this story about these two lawmakers out of Tennessee, how they got expelled for speaking their mind. These two black lawmakers got expelled and they, they're emphasizing the blackness now. These guys here, look at how they're wording this. Two black state lawmakers in Tennessee are expelled. All right, so State Representative Justin Jones and Justin Pearson were expelled for breaking house rules as they protest in favor of gun control. So now these two guys, the one with the afro and the other guy who looked like the singer from the Black Eyed Peas, they got expelled by the white GOP and the white liberal media ran with this thing and they really went into hysterics. Oh God, look at the racism here. Oh, God, this is so racist. This is like Jim Crow all over again. Two black lawmakers who were activists, they got expelled for speaking their mind. Oh, my God, this should look at the this is just so inherently racist. We all got to get behind them, guys. So they went on this whole campaign of how we need to get behind these guys. Oh, we need to fight for these guys, fight against the white GOP's racism against these two black people. And they were really, really in the media pumping this thing up. Oh, we got to fight for them. This is so horrible. This type of racism just shouldn't exist. Oh, this kind of racism is horrible. And we are like, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. We're saying, wait, we're not going to jump up with the capes for these guys. We're not going to jump up with the capes for these guys as of yet. Not, not so fast. Because a lot of this stuff looks very performative. A lot of this stuff looks extremely performative. So you got this one guy, Justin Pearson. That's the brother with the big afro. And the other brother, Justin J Jones. Justin Jones, right here. Let me show you the images of this guy. Justin Jones, who is black. Okay, take a good look at Justin Jones. We'll do some research about this guy. He's actually Filipino and black. They say his dad is black, a black American. But when you look up information about his dad, they don't have anything. They've scrubbed the internet about information about his dad. Okay. So red flags are going up because listen, listen, this whole thing where they trick us into galvanizing a lot of grassroots support for some black folks who are in political spheres, who, who experience some form of racism, they want us to galvanize a lot of grassroots support for them. And then what happens is we start supporting these guys and get a big grassroots support system going for them. And then they'll turn around and use that grassroots support for other non-FBA entities. That's the problem and that's the trick bag that we're not going for. We're asking questions now and that's what we're doing with this guy. With the Justin Jones guy. This guy is... Asian and black. And we don't know who the black part of his family is. Why are they hiding his black dad? Is his dad FBA or non-FBA? See, they know we're asking these questions now. Because his dad could be a Caribbean dude. His dad could be um, an African dude. We don't know who this guy's dad is. That's very important because as we specified, and we've been specifying this, as part of our foundational black American culture, and we put this on the official FBA website. Let me pull that up real quick because we're gonna do some study in here. See, this is all about straightening. This is why we put stuff like this out here. Hold on. 
This is why this is very important for us to have a code of conduct when it pertains to our lineage. All right, let me go to the FBA website. Hold on real quick. I want to read something to you. Why these people with dual allegiances is very important to understand who they are. All right, now check this out right here. This is on the official FBA website. This is why this is important. What's the status of people with half FBA and half immigrant lineage? If you're a person classified as black who has one parent from an immigrant background and another parent who can be traced to the American slave plantations, then you are considered a foundation of black American. This is, there's a very important caveat with this designation. An FBI, FBA individual who is non-FBA, who non-FBA parental lineage comes from a person who immigrated to the United States after 1970 should not be considered or looked upon as a representative or spokesperson for serious political, social, economic, or judicial issues that affect Foundation of Black Americans collectively. The only exception to this rule is the half FBA individual has a verified track record of loyalty and tangible contributions to the betterment of foundational black Americans on a grassroots level, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot be a spokesperson for foundational black Americans if you have dual allegiances unless you have a track record of campaigning for tangible, constructive benefits for foundational black Americans in the past. This is why we have this stuff laid out. This guy, who we don't even know if the black half is even FBA. We don't even know that. I really don't want these people with questionable backgrounds acting as representatives for us. If you act as a representative for Foundation of Black Americans, what is your paperwork, nigga? We are looking for people's paperwork. See, Nipsey, somebody said Nipsey's a great example. The reason Nipsey was so thorough and so loved, Nipsey, half Eritrean, half FBA. Nipsey had a track record for doing things to help foundational black American society and culture. He had a long track record of doing that. That's why our brother Nipsey's paperwork was 100%. He was thorough. Okay? Let's be real. That dual allegiance stuff we ain't playing that dual allegiance stuff. And you're not going to shame us into just supporting somebody because they say they're black and they've experienced some racism. Okay, all right, I don't want nobody to experience racism, but I'm not really going to put the cape on for this dude because we've done that before. We'll sit here and put the cape on for people and ride for them and give them a lot of grassroots support and then they'll flip on us. They'll use that support for all of these other groups and then flip on us. You dig? So we need to know what their agenda is when it comes to black people. And if you don't have a track record for stumping for black folks, I'm not putting the cape on for you. And this guy here, this um, Justin Jones guy, yeah, he's talking about gun rights and all of this stuff, but this guy doesn't have no track record about speaking anything specifically for black people. See, this is the whole Black Lives Matter hustle again. See, they did that with Black Lives Matter. They get out there and, um, yeah, we're going to stand up for justice for Mike Brown, justice for Mike Brown. And then some of these Black Lives Matter activists, they go get arrested. Oh, look, I'm being arrested. Oh, look at the racism. I'm just trying to get some justice and they're arresting me. And then we go stump for them. Hey, you can't arrest this person. Oh, that's not cool. And they get a lot of grassroots support. And then they get out here and we elevate these people and give them street cred. And then they turn around and yeah, by the way, now that I got out of jail and I got all this support, Trans lives matter too now. What? So now they'll use that grassroots momentum to start stumping for all of this other stuff. And then all of a sudden, checks start getting written for all of these non-FBA entities and groups. And we're like, oh, whoa. Where all this money come from and why is it going to all these other people after we done got our heads busted supporting for you? We're not playing that game no more. See, the Black Lives Matter folks did that. That's why Black Lives Matter, that movement fizzled out. And they've abandoned that. All of the people, the so-called leaders of Black Lives Matter, they've all, 
just jump ship, all of them. Because it turned into a big ass finesse. They got the grassroots to support some of these phony ass actors who came in and they all did bait and switches on our asses and they start getting money for all of these other groups and they use our um, grassroots momentum to bring in immigration laws and all of that stuff and LGBT stuff and environmental stuff and then we're left here with an empty ass bag of nothing. You understand? We're not playing that game no more. And this thing with these two guys... That looks like a remix of Black Lives Matter, and that's why we're asking questions about these dudes. Rightfully so, and I put some stuff on social media asking questions that then went viral. We're asking questions like, hey, well, let me show the, the tweet. Because I put up a tweet about these guys a couple of days ago and went viral. Hold on, let me find that tweet. I put up a tweet about these guys with a very simple question. Where's that tweet? Where's that tweet? Right here. Right here. Look, I put up this simple tweet right here of these guys' picture. Where's your family from? Where y'all from? And, well, we got damn near 300,000 views on that thing. And here's people caping. What's that supposed to mean? Because he's mixed. He's a, he's a person of color. We can't stand with him. Black folks surely can find a way to divide amongst ourselves. This is tether talk right here. And I called out these Democratic Shield accounts. Yeah, that's another red flag. Now that we're asking questions about these dudes, all of these Democratic Shield sock puppets accounts then popped out of all over the place. They popped out of everywhere. All of these sock puppet accounts then popped out of nowhere. And like I said, with these guys, it's very performative. And, and listen, we can't cape for everybody because they've run this game on us before where they'll get somebody out here and something racist will happen to them and then the white media will pump up the racist incident and then get us to support them and then they'll get up here and then flip on us. You know who did that? They did that with Lil Nas X. They did that bait and switch thing with Lil Nas X. For those who don't remember, when Lil Nas X first came out, they put out a story, and, and I fell for this too. They put out a story, this right here. Where is this? 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 Hold on. All right here, okay. So they put out this story here. And got us to support this dude. Lil Nas X's song was removed from Billboard for not being country enough. But who gets to decide the category? So they put out this story about Lil Nas X. And they played up his blackness. 19-year-old black musician from Atlanta. His hit song, Old Town Road, was removed from Billboard's Hot Country Songs last week. Claiming it wasn't country enough. So they played the racism aspect up and we were caping for um, Lil Nas X myself included I put on the cape for Lil Nas X I was like hey man so they took off this is in 90 right here this is um, 2019 they took Lil Nas X off the country charts but on Music Row in Nashville they have a sign congratulating Billy Ray, Billy Ray Cyrus on being on the remix so I was calling it out so a lot of us on the grassroots we were supporting Lil Nas X against racism all right this was a trick they used on us man and i fell for it trick me once you're not gonna trick me again so they got us they 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 got us i'll admit when i got got we all got got me too they said hey look this this young black guy who has a hit record they're being racist towards him guys come on what are we gonna do i'm like oh that's not cool so now you got a lot of grassroots support Speaking out against racism for Lil Nas X. Now there's grassroots support. So now that the grassroots supported Lil Nas X, he gets up here all of a sudden, a little while later, you like, guess what, guys? By the way, I'm LGBT. And thank you for all the grassroots support. And then it became, hey, guys, I'm LGBT, and the black community is real homophobic. Whoa, whoa. So, nigga, we done sat here and gave you all of this grassroots support, and then it was black people stomping for you. 
giving you that grassroots cred, you get up here, turn around, announce your sexuality, which they had planned all along, and then you flip on black society talking about how we ain't shit because we homophobic and we don't accept you. All right, you got us. You got us, nigga. All right. That whole Lil Nas X thing was a social engineering thing. They got us on him. They got us. They got us. All right. You did? Okay. They told him to do that. Yeah, they engineered that. They engineered it. Let me tell you something. They'll engineer a racist incident, ladies and gentlemen. They'll engineer a racist incident and then play it up. Oh, God, look at the racism here. Oh, hey, come on, you black activists. Are we going to stand for this kind of racism? Come on. And then we'll jump out there and give grassroots support to it. And once the grassroots support is there, then they'll flip. By the way, this guy's gay too, so let's use some of that support to stump for his sexuality too. Yeah? So they're doing the same thing with this situation with these two lawmakers. I think this whole thing about them being expelled, I think that this was orchestrated too. Y'all better understand, the Republicans and the Democrats, they get behind closed doors and orchestrate a lot of this stuff. They orchestrate this stuff. They sit back and plan this performative ass stuff, dude. I'm telling you. So they'll sit here and plan on, hey, we'll oust these guys and then get a lot of outrage and get the black grassroots to jump on it so that we'll start supporting the political process. And then they'll reinstate them because they're already talking about reinstating these guys. This whole thing about them being ousted, they're talking about reinstating these guys again, guys. Hold on. Let me find that real quick. Justin Jones, and they're talking about reinstating these guys. Where's the thing? Where's the thing? Where's the thing? Where's the thing? Um, okay, right here. So they're talking about the majority of Nashville council members say they will vote to reinstate the expelled legislator. So yeah, they're, they're going to reinstate these guys. So they, they'll get a lot of outrage going. They'll get us galvanized against the racism because, see, they don't have a Trump right now. Trump is already going through what he's going through. So they need to have a white supremacist boogeyman that the Democrats can point to to say, hey, we need to galvanize our energy to go against the white supremacist boogeyman. That is the old evil white GOP. Yeah. That's the game that they're playing. And again, I am not supporting anybody who doesn't have a black agenda, specifically talking about reparations. That's how serious and I am how about white it. Whoa, 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 I mean play this. Yeah, I'm talking about we got to get some reparations going on, and you better specifically be talking about reparations. You got to be on that reparations kick. And if you ain't talking about that, I'm just not rocking with these people. Now, this guy, Justin Jones, when you go to his website, he ain't talking about nothing black, nothing specifically for black people. There's nothing about a black agenda on this guy's site. This is his site right here, the Justin Jones website. Now, you go here, a lot of vague terms. Our democracy, economy, and environment are all in crisis. Oh, Lord. And the first thing, you go down, yeah, they got the, the black fist up and all of that, but ain't no damn black agenda. Let my people vote. Okay. All right. It's a lot of vague. Look at this. Justin has fought for justice since childhood. As a college student, he organized for health care against racist policing and led campaigns for the expansion of Medicaid in Tennessee, uh, the uh, repeal of restrictive state voter ID laws and confronted systematic racism in the halls of power. Okay, and you go down, the first thing he got, immigration and refugee rights. Man, stop. No, there ain't no black agenda here. There is no black agenda with this guy. I'm not rocking with nobody who ain't got no black agenda. It's black agenda time. You got to be stomping for black folks. There's no black agenda there. He's talking about getting a bunch of immigrants in. Yeah. And let me tell you something, because he's black and Filipino, um, they orchestrated, there's a reason why they used him. He's Kamala Harris 2.0. They're going to do a Kamala Harris with this guy. 
You think that's a coincidence that this guy is black and Filipino and I'm questioning the black part? Let me tell you something. That's Kamala Harris 2.0. Get a they're giving him they're trying to give him some black street cred now. Just like with Kamala Harris, with Kamala Harris, she went to an HBCU. That's her black street cred. They're trying to he's a young this is a young dude, so they're trying to use us to give him political street cred so later on when he's running for office for a big big position yeah, he had the black grassroots really rolling for him. He was The black community was really stomping for this dude. No, we weren't. We were questioning his ass. See, they're trying to give him some street cred right now. And we're questioning this. We're not giving it to him. You ain't got no black agenda because what they'll do, we sit here and support this guy, give him grassroots support. He's going to use that to push... To push some stuff for Asians, for immigrants, for LGBT, all of these other groups. You dig? Know? I can see the flip coming a mile away with this guy. The, the flip is already in play. I can see that coming a mile away. And hell, let's look at some of his tweets. Well, one of his tweets. Let's go to one of this guy's tweets. The Justin Jones. Because I don't see, I don't hear nothing about him stomping specifically for black folks, but this is him right here thinking of our Asian family tonight. Seeing news of a white mass shooter in Georgia who targeted massage parlors in his attack, eight precious lives taken, anti-Asian hate crimes continue to rise and we must stand together. White supremacists is a danger to us all. Stop Asian hate. When has he stumped for an anti-black hate crime bill for us? Huh? This dude is showing where his allegiance is. I'm good on this dude. No, not hating on him. This dude's allegiance is with other, his Asian side. Knock yourself out. Don't do performative blackness around us. You ain't really stomping for any black agenda. So I'm good. I'm cool. You, you see? Don't play don't don't let these people run this game on us man. Don't let them run no game on us and the other guy the Justin Pearson guy he has he might be FBA but his he has a very performative vibe. Hold on. This Justin Pearson guy Hold on one second. Now this guy his background is kind of questionable. He got the whole performative afro. Hold on. This is the Justin Pearson guy. This, this, it, it looks too. He, he's trying too hard to black it up. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And yeah. And he, he right here has on a dashiki and the dashiki with the afro and yeah. And this is this is him without the afro. Where's this picture? This is him from a couple of years back. And guys, I don't know about y'all. Some of these pictures. Hold on. When you look at some of these pictures, I know. Well, I don't know what you think, but um, I, I smell something. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. Y'all look at these pictures. I, I don't. I, I, I hate to say I, I, I smell some bussy juice. No, I don't smell Jolof. I smell bussy juice. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not trying to be mean spirited. I'm not trying to be mean spirited, but some of these pictures, the way he holding that fist up, yeah, the way he holding up that fist is, is you know, look a little dainty. All right. You, you, feel, you see where I'm going with it? He's holding that fist up a little dainty. All right, yeah, right here. I, I, I smell some bussy sauce in the room. No disrespect. He holding that fist up. That's how Jesse Smollett was holding that fist up. He holding that fist up just a little dainty. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm just saying, guys. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the wrist looks a little limp. I'm just saying that. 
All right. No disrespect, but um, I, I think there's another agenda he might he might try to usher in, because when you read some of his stuff. Hold on. We're going to get into this. We're going to look at this thing from all angles here. He wrote like a little um, he this is like from a speech he did. This is from a speech he did. Hold on. All right. Hold on. Let me let me show you all some transcripts from a speech. Because, see, they'll talk a little black for a second. So this is like a little speech that he did. This is Voices We Will Never Quit by Justin Pearson. All right. All right. All glory and honor to God who makes all things possible, who takes the son of teenage parents and brings him to an institution built by enslaved people. All right. Okay, let me go down. How is that? How is it that you still have hope, you descendant of enslaved people? How is it that you still have hope? So he's using some of the language that we use. All right. Even now, as our own brothers and sisters lay to rest because of the failure of people in position of power to do something, because people are refusing to pass laws to end the epidemic of gun violence in the state of Tennessee, my people have yet to quit. And so even now, amidst this vote, amidst this persecution, I remember the good news, has, have, have, hallelujah, Jesus. I remember that on Friday, the government decided that my savior, Jesus, a man that was innocent of all crimes except for fighting for the poor, fighting for the marginalized, fighting for the LGBTQ community, fighting for those who are single mothers, fighting for those who are ostracized, fighting for those pushed to the periphery, my savior, my black Jesus, oh Lord. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, this is Andrew Gillum 2.0. So yeah, they get a dude who's a, a tether and then get an LGBT dude, allegedly, to try to push them out as our representatives. And they'll use some of our talking points and mix it in with a whole bunch of other stuff. And then with this Justin Pearson guy, did y'all see the speech that he did when he took on this weird, performative MLK cadence? He started trying to talk like Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was very performative and weird. Listen to this. This is him giving a speech trying to sound like Dr. King. It was real. That, that really threw me off about this guy. Hold on. Yes, I tell you, it was a sad day on Saturday. All hope seemed to be lost. Representatives were thrown out of the state house. Democracy seemed to be at its end. Seemed like the NRA and gun lobbyists might win. But all that was good news for us. I don't know how long this Saturday in the state of Tennessee might last. But oh, we have good news, folks. We've got good news that Sunday always comes. Resurrection is a promise. And it is a prophecy. It's a prophecy that came out of the cotton fields. It's a prophecy that came out of the lynching tree. It's a prophecy that still lives in each and every one of us in order to make the state see the place that it ought to be in so I've still got hope because I know we are still here and we will never quit. I don't want to... oh, look, at, look at all white folks. When, when you see white folks supporting something like this, you know something is up. You know there's a red flag when all these white people are, uh, are on this shit. Look at all these white people. It, it, look, 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 uh, look at the visuals. There's a bunch of white people, but they, they got all the black people and kind of grounded them around him. They put all the black people around him to make it look like there's a bunch of black people co-signing this performative bullshit, and it ain't. All right? All the black people in the building are surrounding them. Out of order. All of those are white people cheering, guys. Yeah, I'm cool. I'm cool. 
with that performative stuff. No, 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 ain't no black agenda. You ain't got no black agenda, buddy. It's all of that performative stuff. I ain't with it. Y'all better peep the game here. And now the white people are trying to shame us into supporting these. No, 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 no. I'm only supporting a black agenda at this point, guys. That's where I am. We are supporting a black agenda, particularly a foundational black American agenda, ladies and gentlemen. We're not supporting this performative nonsense. I don't give a damn. It's all about foundational black Americans, ladies and gentlemen. Because the minute we get around this dude and we support that stuff, they are going to flip. They're going to flip hard. We are not getting with anybody else who's going to flip on us. You better come out the gate talking about a black agenda. This whole thing where we're talking around a black agenda, we're not doing that no more. We're speaking specifically about what's needed for foundation of black Americans. This whole thing where we're afraid to speak up about what we need because we're going to offend people, those days are over. Family, right now, we have the U.S. Census Board looking at delineating because of the grassroots effort that we put forward. This is the power of the grassroots. They're doing everything they can to get us off of that. Family, it is so very important. For And, and they got some more of those meetings and, and hearings and things for the reparations. And also, everybody needs to get involved. Where are the links for the... Um, the comment section for the, the Census Bureau and all of those people where we can let them know what we want our designation to be. It's very important that we let them know we want to be classified as foundational black Americans. It's important to have that delineation because you can't remix foundational black American. You can remix all of that other stuff. Foundational black American is one thing they cannot remix. That's why that term scares a lot of the white supremacists, because you can't remix it. You can tack all of these other people onto it. And, and FBA family, you better understand the importance of your lineage as being foundational black Americans and the words you use. Because here's the thing. You can say, well, we're descendants of slaves, but they can always come back and say, well, there was slavery and where we came from too. There was slavery over where we came from too, which is true. Other societies had slavery, but there's only one group who's foundational to this nation. That's the thing that sets us apart from everybody. No group can claim to be foundational to this country other than foundational black Americans. That makes us unique, thorough, and exceptional in so many ways. You, FBA family, you come from the lineage of the only people who are foundational to this nation. You built this nation from scratch. You built it from the ground up. You did not immigrate here from any place. There was no place to immigrate to until your lineage built this place. Y'all better understand the importance of that. We better walk into that glory right there. That's our uniqueness right there. That's why the term foundational is so, 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 so very important because nobody can claim foundational. You dig? And that's the thing that, that chaps a lot of people's asses. That's where a lot of that tether hatred comes from. Because we did not flee nowhere. You see, we didn't flee. That's where so much contempt comes in. Because these people come over here, many of them have a complex about fleeing. So they come over and try to denigrate us any way they can. And we have to check that nonsense at the door. Um, did y'all see the video? I posted this on my um, Twitter the other day. That, that Haitian woman, I posted her before. She did a video talking about fleeing, trying to justify her fleeing and her family fleeing, trying to justify fleeing again, talking about everybody flees. No, we don't. Hold on one second. Let me, let me play this clip of this woman right here. And I want y'all to understand, this is the mindset of the tether class. Not all immigrants, but just that, that jealous-ass tether class 
who have contempt for us. I want y'all to understand this is the mindset and this type of insecurity. Yeah. I want y'all to understand a lot of them think like this. You try to justify their fleeing. Hold on. What most immigrants do is, like immigrants do, is flee away from danger. I love the idea of go back to your country because there's this mentality that there's a claim to something. Your entire country is based off of people that flee. Like, that is what people do. No. Who? Did anybody in your family flee? This entire country is based on people who fleed, not fled. Her ass said they who fleed. No, it ain't. Nobody in my family fled. Nigga. N none. Nobody in, no, on neither side of my family fled nowhere. Speak for your damn self. We stayed here and dealt with these damn white supremacists. No, no, no. Don't you put your fleeing ass mentality on us. No, we didn't. This ain't a country of fleers. No. Nobody in my family. Did anybody in your family flee? My, my, my family in the room? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, no. Speak for yourself, ma'am. Ain't nobody fled my family. You don't speak for us. Not a damn person in my family fled nothing. We stayed here and dealt with this shit and made a better way. Yeah. There was some, even in the comment section, there was some, some tethers in there. Well, some of y'all fled from the plantation and went up to Canada on the Underground Railroad. Don't let them run that Canada shit on you either. There were a handful of FBAs who went up to Canada. Most of the Underground Railroad was in the South. Most of the Underground Railroad, they went into the swamps. Yeah, they got their freedom by going into Florida, going into the swamps. So yeah, they were fighting for their freedom. They were in um, prison camps. So yeah, you're supposed to get out of a goddamn prison camp. Somebody's enslaving you and raping you. You're supposed to get out of that and fight your way out of it. You're fleeing from your damn own homeland where you can just sit there and just make shit better for yourself. That's a re real big difference. Yeah? Let's get that straight. So that's why they love to promote the northbound Underground Railroad because, see, there were white people involved. See, they don't tell you about them swamps and brothers fighting and freeing themselves and becoming maroons and things like that. That's why y'all better get the movie American Maroon. We break all this stuff down. We break all of this stuff down. But, yeah, we don't come from a lineage of goddamn fleeing. Don't put that on us, ma'am. Speak for yourself. You do not speak for us. Hold on. Let me play the rest of this. Hold on. I love the idea of go back to your country because there's this mentality that there's a claim to something. Your entire country is based off of people that flee. Like, that is what people do. They flee. If it ain't working out there and the oppression is way too bad, they flee for better opportunities. Um, or, or they do what we do. We fight the oppressive system and make better opportunities in our own homeland. No, you don't flee. You fight the oppressive system and then you make things better like we did. You, you see? No, you don't flee. Everybody can't flee. Somebody has to fight somebody for some goddamn rights and some justice. You see? You know, don't sit here and lie. Hold on. Let me play the rest of this, this woman. Hold on. That is what people do. They flee. If it ain't working out there and the oppression is way too bad, they flee for better opportunities. Some people want to sit there and fight all day, but other people actually want to raise their children and they don't want to spend their life fighting. Okay, boy, th this right here, see, th that's coward tether talk right there. So y'all FBAs want to fight all the time. Man, we just want to raise our kids. Fool, you're able to flee over here to raise your damn kids in peace because of us fighting. Duh. How do you think you have a place to flee to and enjoy freedoms? Who do you think made that happen? See, a lot of these tethers, they got this mentality that they're so great innately that white people like them. 
And it was white people from the goodness of their heart that said, hey, come on over here and join us because we like you better than these FBAs. So they've mind screwed themselves into believing that nonsense that white people somehow took a liking to them. No, fool. White people did not want you over here. White people had immigration um, policies that wouldn't let black folks over here in, in big numbers at all. We had to fight them for that. We had to make these people allow you to come over here. During the, the, the early 1900s, when you had black people in Tuskegee and other places fighting to have immigrants come over, that's how Marcus Garvey was able to come over. That was us fighting to let black immigrants come over here because they didn't want black immigrants coming here then. Because the black immigrants were over there building the Panama Canal, so they wanted to start coming up here when the canal was finished, and they start putting laws together like, hey, don't let them niggas come up here. We, black folks in Tuskegee and in the South and black grassroots organizations said, hey, no, 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 no. We can't have that. Let them brothers and sisters come over here. So in the early 1900s and in the mid-1960s, we were the ones fighting for immigration rights to let black people come over here because we wanted them to be reinforcements for us. Don't let these people remix history. Y'all want to do all that fighting. Fool, you able to bring your shiny wig ass over here because we fought to make it happen. Somebody has to fight the oppressive system. Everybody can't be a fleer like you. You dig? That's why they have so much contempt for us. Why y'all fight? We Somebody has to fight. If we don't fight, we're going to be just like y'all. Down bad. So we as foundational black Americans, we understand fleeing ain't really a, an option. We don't want to flee. How about we just stand where we are and, and, and put our backs to the wall and start fighting the oppressive system? We are the only group, foundational black Americans, who has consistently, consistently, consistently fought the system of white supremacy head on. And we are a numerical minority over here. That's why we get so much props around the world. People see the courage that we have. That's why when Steve Harvey said that bullshit, y'all get the courage from them Africans, man. Nigga, where? <laughs> y'all get them courage from them, man. What? That's why we're looking at him like, nigga, what are you talking about? Somebody has to fight somewhere. Everybody can't run. So you're not going to criticize us for fighting the oppressive system because you're over here enjoying the fruits of our fighting, ma'am. You're enjoying the fruit of our fighting. Just because y'all come over here and kiss the first white ass you see, all of us ain't on that. We know that's, a, that's, that's an empty gesture. That don't work. We know that don't work. Yeah? We realized early on, hey, we can't go along with these people They'll wipe us the hell out. We realize that. We got to be 10 toes down on these folks and fight for whatever we need. Let me play some more of this woman. Hold on. Where are we at? Hold on. Way too bad, they flee for better opportunities. Some people want to sit there and fight all day, but other people actually want to raise their children and they don't want to spend their life fighting. Do you get that? Do you understand that? No, you don't? Okay, no problem. So now let's move forward. So as an immigrant, I'm here in this country. What do I want to do? Put my best foot forward. What do my parents want to do? Put their best foot forward and give us the best opportunity they possibly can. Thank you, Lord, for my parents because they did exactly that. But it's my turn as their child to hold the baton. And one thing I always say, my parents did not risk their lives to get to America for me to get involved in some political warfare. My parents did not risk their lives for me to get to America, for me to sit here fighting people all day. That makes absolutely no sense. And I well, to a tether, yeah, it don't make no sense. That's why you got to flee, ma'am. Yeah, standing up for yourself and fighting for justice, it don't make no sense to you. How does that work for you in your homeland? That's why you have to flee. Because standing up for yourself and fighting for justice, that don't make no sense. Yeah, ma'am, that's why you flee it. That's why it's you you failed in your homeland. That's coward talk. Yeah? That's coward talk. And I'm glad they're letting you know this is the mindset. 
when they tell us we all brothers, we all brothers. No, this is why we see people who kind of look like us and their mentality is like, I ain't about to fight these white people. Hell, I, my come up, I've already got my come up by coming over here eating off you niggas. I ain't about to fight nothing. And in fact, I'm joining the white folks against your ass. You think? Yeah, Dessaline got assassinated by some of his own dudes. Yeah, this, this is all really geared towards us as foundational black Americans. These people have contempt for the, let me say, the fact that we stand up and we fight and we are, we got real courage consistently throughout the generations, not just the one off like the, the Haitian Revolution. They'll, you can hang your hat on that, but just remember, that's the whoop there it is of revolutions. As a one hit wonder, y'all ended up killing Dessaline and all of the other riders, and then the coon class took over down there. Okay? Hold on. Let me play the rest of this woman here. Hold on. They're here fighting people all day. That makes absolutely no sense. And I think because you guys have never taken that level of a risk, you don't understand that level of responsibility and accountability. That's really the problem here. Because if you really risk your lives to have something, if you really risk your life to get something, you're not willing and ready to throw it away. So that may be- Risk what, fleeing? You just, you risk your life hopping on a boat or hopping on whatever's floating to flee? Where I am here in America, it makes me say to myself, especially as I'm evolving, growing, growing through healing, I'm one of those people that I believe in therapy, I believe in coaching, I believe in... Okay. Here's a part two. I didn't see the part two. Hold on. But one of the things that I found myself being very concerned about is my experience as a... Wait, 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 wait. A black woman. Well, why is it doing that? Especially with the last election, when you saw like this... I. Okay, hold on of like oh my gosh if you're black you better do this you better do that and i'm like hold on wait that's what really made me say uh uh i don't like this like why are you telling me i have to do this because i'm black when it's been already pointed out that i'm haitian why do i now have to now submit so when we say we're foundational black american and we're different y'all niggas are xenophobic this woman just said why i gotta say i'm black when i'm haitian they understand there is a difference. They understand that there is a difference. When we acknowledge the difference, because there is a difference, they try to play the xenophobic thing on us. No, no, we ain't going for that no more. I'm not black, I'm Haitian. You see? Don't be ashamed to acknowledge your foundation of black American lineage, ladies and gentlemen. Because these folks will delineate from you at the drop of a hat. They will delineate from you at the drop of a damn hat. Let me play the rest of this. Hold on. Hold on. It's a, this idea of being black. That makes absolutely no sense to me. And that's what you don't get. A lot of people are challenging that idea and that thought is because of their lived experience. Maybe if you guys listen to what was being said instead of gaslighting people and you made a conscious effort to make sure that different immigrants and different people were having a different experience, maybe they wouldn't feel the way that they do. But when you have a certain experience, I'm sorry, that's what happens, okay? So now the hell is she talking about? Hold on. And have a three-year-old boy, okay? They are black. My ex-husband is a black man. Matter of fact, my ex-husband is an African-American man. Not that that matters, but let's talk about it, okay? Because I saw, especially when it comes to my relationship with my ex-husband, I saw how destructive the culture was in impacting him, impacting his family. These are things that we talked about. These are things that we walked through. And any woman that has ever been in a relationship with a black man that has ever felt safe of expressing himself and and how he feels then you know that that is a topic that comes up and so much time i spent trying to heal him friends different people just i've walked through in life and i understood especially for the people that are born here in america and have a lineage that is tied to this land i understand how much psychological warfare has been done to basically imprison the mind to see and think a certain kind of way absolutely ma'am your homeland people are eating dirt pies. What are you talking about? You can't sit here and talk about the what we've gone through and your homeland is in rubbles right now? Absolutely brilliant, man. But I can say today the major reason for our divorce is cultural differences. That's just the reality of it. I have nothing but love for him and I know he has nothing but love for me, but culturally it just wasn't going to work and we had to accept that. Hold on, I'm listening to... I'm Deal, especially blackness as an identity. Even right now... Hold on. 
Now, there's a lot of Haitian friends I had, especially when we went through that war in the 90s, a lot of us came together. Well, what happened is some people assimilated, some people assimilated to that culture that was around predominantly, especially if you were in a more urban area. And if you come from a more urban area or inner city, which I wasn't deep in the inner city, however, still close enough because back in those times, the school zones still will put you in the same school with certain people. So you might go home and live in a completely different neighborhood, but the buses took many of you guys to the same school, which is why I understand you'll see that certain school zones to protect themselves some people what they will do is that advocate for their children they will become very specific about drawing out those territories of what those school zones look like and they would rather school zone children or bus children 30 minutes away versus the kids that are five minutes away this is a real thing happening right now i can't come with my cultural identity i can't come avec creole when kem women parler pour tes commencer parler ti creole when ap gen problème avec moi m comprendre ça i can't come with all of okay you just spoke french lady that's french and make like a little french creole that's french all right your culture is French. That's French you just spoke. This in that environment and think to be accepted, that's okay. Because I think separation is a part of life. Separation doesn't have to be a negative thing. But what happens is, is what... Oh, okay. Now, she's talking about separation. Immigrants, I want y'all to hear what this woman is saying. How they don't really want to go to school with us. They want to have their own school zones and all of that stuff. But, but, but benefit off the black programs and then carve off the resources for their own little enclaves and then siphon us off for whatever they get, okay? Separation ain't bad. Oh, you damn right it's, it's not bad. You damn right it's not bad. You say Haitian, Haitian Creole is, is French Creole. That's a, it's like a Creole version of French, all right? These are French words that they've kind of amalgamated a little bit. It's, it's based on French, all right? Let's stop that. But it's Haitian Creole. It's based off French. These are French words. It's based off French. You know? It's bad French. All right? It's broken down French. Yeah, don't, don't play this game. It's, it's just a broken... It's just like... We speak like Ebonics, but it's English. It's Ebonics, but it's English. Well, don't play that game now. Thank you. French Ebonics. It's French Ebonics. All right? <laughs> Don't play. It's French Ebonics, what she just did. It's broken French. Uh, it's Haitian Creole, no, which is broken French. All right? Let's keep it above. Broken fucking French. All right? Let's play that game. Creole here, Creole sound different. It's broken French, man. All right? It's broken French. <laughs> Don't start talking about your culture and all. It's broken French. That's all it is. It's Ebonic French. Oh, uh, let's stop this game. Right, you want to separate? Go ahead and separate. Knock yourself out. But when we delineate and say, hey, we're foundational black Americans, accept that too. You yeah? Accept that. See, we got to watch the game that's being played out here, see? And she said she had an African-American husband. Interesting. Now, she said, was, was her parents immigrants or was she an anchor baby? Was she trying to get a green card? Because that's another thing. Um, and, uh, did her husband get used for her to anchor some babies here? Because we got to watch out for that, too. And this is another thing. There's a, another, uh, there's a video of this black woman who, who foundation black American. She's a Pan-Africanist, bless her heart, Dr. Wanda. She goes, she went to Africa and she's complaining about what's happening in Africa right now. Just, you know, the Pan-African thing ain't really popping like it. it. It really never really popped like that. But now people are waking up to it. And here's this sister, one of our FBA sisters. She's over there and complaining about what's going on in Africa right now as far as Pan-Africanism, which is what we've been saying. Hold on. You know, living in Africa, and now I've been in Ghana three years, no break, okay? I really have come to understand that Africans do not have an understanding of what it means to be a Pan-Africanist. Duh! They don't under have, understand that. Even though the liberating president, Kwame Nkrumah, put great work in that. He was meeting with these black leaders. Man, Nkrumah, man... 
the the a lot of our Pan African brothers and sisters, man, bless their heart. They want to hang their hat on Nkrumah. These folks now don't have the Nkrumah spirit, man. We just got to realize when the Nkrumah days are over. They don't have Nkrumah spirit, man. We we got a habit of hanging on to some shit from back in the day, not knowing that the spirit is completely different now, man. It's a whole different energy now, man. That Nkrumah spirit ain't there no more. And, and, and really made it clear that no matter where the African was dispersed, whether it was in the Americas or the Caribbean or Jamaica, they were, they were authentically African. And we shared the mother line in common. They don't understand what that is. So um, this, the, the, to the idea that an African man, and now I'm referring to my estranged husband, would select a woman who is a clear pan-Africanist, like I... Spend, have spent the last five years of my life coming back and forth to the continent. I've been to Africa eight times in five years. And in, during that time, my predominant role has been to bring books, learning aid, technology, to assist with any sort of um, elevation of cre creative thought, to teach, to counsel on some levels, I've been involved with, you know, fundraising for roofs for schools, for uh, helping with home toilets, helping with with uh, mobility um, aids like wheelchairs. That's recently what what I've involved myself with. Um, any way that I can serve, we we always do that, man. And so we we go over there and just roll out the red carpet and just do what we can to help people. And it's all one sided, man. The continent. I can serve my mother. I consider myself the lost child. Okay, let me let me play part two. Hold on. I can serve my mother. I consider myself the lost child. This is, I'm returning to my mother. Yeah, and, and, and let me say this. Let me say this. Black people, let's get off that lost child bullshit because that's what happens. A lot of us have cultural low self-esteem. That's why understanding our foundation of black American culture and lineage is very important. So y'all can get off that lost child shit that they've been pushing on us for, for, for decades. We've been told by the educational system and the powers that be that we are like almost an immigrant type group who's lost and don't know where we, no, stop it. We've been on this land for centuries. We are the only people who can trace um, our ancestors by name going back centuries. Other groups can't really do that. That lost child nonsense, throw that away. We are not lost. We are foundational black Americans. We have a deep rooted history and we can trace it back more than any other group. Some of these African groups, they've moved and fled all around the continent of Africa. Those countries are relatively new. Those countries, many of them were carved up during the Berlin Conference in the, eight, the late 1800s. A lot of them don't know what the countries were before then. They don't know where their tribe came from over there. They were running all over the place. The Arabs were smacking them up. Then the Portuguese were smacking them up and then recarving out the, the areas over there. Um, they didn't been colonized and remixed. Many of the people don't have birth records. So don't let them promote that low self-esteem bullshit on us. We know who we are and we're good with who we are. We don't have to trace back into some damn ancient history. We know enough about who we are to be rooted in our culture and our culture to be the dominant culture on the planet. Foundational black American culture is the dominant culture on the damn planet. And don't you ever forget that. Hold on. Let me play some more of this sister here. Let me play some more. Hold on. Whether she's sick, fractured, or whatever, that's what I do. In fact, he came to know of me when I was coming back from Tanzania, where the effort there was solar panels, solar panels and books. So why would you pick this woman, want to marry this woman, and think that a Pan-Africanist, the level of work I've been putting in on the continent, that that person is going to get you a green card to go back to America, which... We view it as Babylon. We know America. We know what she founded on. We know her fracture straight, her fra fra fracture state. So this sister basically got finessed. She took her ass over there, her arms open wide, all my African brothers and sisters, and met a nigga, and he did the old finesse game on her ass, tried to get a green. Yeah, 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 this is the motherland. Oh, yes, yes, yes. When we going back to visit your family, because when we go, I'm staying. 
She went over there and got finessed. A nigga over there trying to get a green card out of her ass. He's trying to come over here. She talking about, oh, it's Babylon. No, no, no. Babylon is over there too. The world is Babylon. Y'all get off that Babylon bullshit. Ain't no paradise nowhere. We got to make it. And her frailty. Why would you think that was going to happen? So it's just interesting our understanding of even our ideologies. Here, Ghana, they have the Black Star Soccer League. They have no idea that that's connected to Marcus Garvey and all that, that amazing um, set of boats, ships he had to ship black folks back to the motherland. And until we have an understanding of that, this man made an error. You can't ride off a Pan-Africanist back to the U.S. It's never going to happen. It's not personal. It's just how it is. Our effort is to come back here. No, it ain't. Auntie, you got finessed, and uh, we're not getting finessed with you. No, ma'am. You can sit over there and deal with the finesse that they ran on your ass. Knock yourself out, auntie. We're not getting finessed. My home is here. I am a foundational black American. My family built this country, and I am going to enjoy this country. The countries that were over in Africa that we came from, possibly centuries ago, don't even exist no more. Yeah? The world is Babylon. Yeah? Don't play that game. Of, this is Babylon. The world is Babylon. You see more evil shit going on over there than here. The world is Babylon. We make things right, right where we stand. This is our home, and we're rooted and grounded here, and we're going to make things right here. See, they, that's the whole con game. They, they sit here and tell us, that's that Rotimi thing, remember? Man, man, and Akon, Rotimi and Akon up here telling us, man, y'all need to go to Africa, man. Man, when you go to Africa, man, you go to Nigeria, when you breathe the air, man, it's like you, man, you breathing freedom. When, when you breathe the air over here, you breathing in problem, man. Y'all need to go to Africa. Well, nigga, why are you in Atlanta? Why your ass over here? Why are you up here? Akon, Akon telling us we need to go to Senegal and oh, it's going to be popping. Why are you over here? Why are you, you talking about Akon City, but you over here? You, you see? They're trying to tether us over there so they can tether themselves over here. No, thank you. No, thank you. We're not playing that game. We're in here heavy tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We're here. Retweet this. Let everybody know we're live. We got almost 7,000 people in here, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all need to come visit the Hidden History Museum, by the way. Um, people are loving the Hidden History Museum. People love the Hidden History Museum. If you're in L.A., come by the Hidden History Museum. We're open every day. We're Monday through Friday from 11 to 4. Come on through the Hidden History Museum and enjoy the Hidden History Museum. And come and buy a T-shirt coming by um, the American Maroon DVD. We got other DVDs there. Come and enjoy the Hidden History Museum. Now, Wednesday, we're going to start, not, not this coming Wednesday, but in the, in the next coming Wednesdays, pretty soon, we're going to start having a comedy night at the Hidden History Museum. We're going to have a lot of up-and-coming um, comedians um, in town. We're going to have comedy night there. That's going to be a regular thing every Wednesday at the Hidden History Museum. We'll keep you guys posted on that. If you're in L.A., you got to come on through that. That's going to be popping. And also, family, we need everybody to do a regular um, donation to the museum to help us keep everything popping. Um, HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. HiddenHistoryMuseum.com. Um, you guys can make a monthly donation, a recurring donation. You say, show us the normal day at the spot. I got something better for you guys. We actually have a reality show, like a semi-documentary that we shot like a reality show about the daily activity of the museum. I'm already on it. And that's going to be on the FBA stream site in a couple of weeks. We got a, a, something called Tariq Nasheed's Museum Life. So that's going to be on FBA Stream soon. How many of you guys subscribe to FBA Stream? We got the Museum Life mini documentary slash reality show that's going to show you the daily activities at the museum. 
It's funny that you would even ask that. That is very funny. Yes. Yes, indeed. We need political workshops. Yes, we do. We're going to have that too. We're going to have that too. Yeah. So that's why you guys need to, I, I need to have a, I'm going to have my editor. He's putting it together now. It's being edited right now. We already shot it. So it's being edited right now. Yeah. So yes, that's going to be on FBA stream pretty soon. Yeah, so that's going to be on FBA stream in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Will the fight be in it? No. Which fight? Oh, I, I see. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, we almost got 7,000 people in here right now. Yeah, we almost got 7,000 people in here. So, yeah, so that's going to be on FBA stream. Speaking of documentaries, did y'all hear about um, there's a documentary coming out about the, <laughs> about um, the 94 Freaknik? There's a documentary that's coming out on, I think it's going to be on Hulu. It's going to be on Hulu. And they're talking about, it's a documentary. Hold on, let me, let me show this right here. Um, Hulu announces Freak Nick, the wildest party never told documentary. So yeah, the, okay, what is this ad shit? What is this ad? So yeah, nigga, they're gonna be talking about Freak Nick and I, they're gonna be, I think they're gonna focus on the 94 Freak Nick but I think they're going to be talking about all of them. They're going to talk about the rise and fall of Freaknik and why it was in decline. And here's the thing. Some of the Freaknik aunties are, are kind of nervous about it right now. For the, how, how many of you are old enough to remember Freaknik? Oh, yes. And we talked about Freaknik before on here. Now, Freaknik, I don't know when it's coming. I want to see it. That's going to be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Now, we got to watch it because I want to see what direction they're going in. Some people say they might be trying to do it to make brothers look like rapists. Yeah. Because what happened was there was a big decline in Freaknik. Freaknik used to pop off. Freaknik was really popping at one point. Then going into the late 90s, that's when it fell off. Then the vibe got real thirsty and dusty. But initially, the Freak Nick vibe was popping. Let me tell y'all something. 94 through 96 was popping. See, Freak Nick started off, it was about really hooking up. The name of the game of Freak Nick was about hooking up. You go to Freak Nick. Wasn't too many cameras out there like that. People, it wasn't no camera phones. People didn't have camera phones. You might have had one or two dudes with some camcorders. But Freak Nick, the early, the 94, 95, it was about, hey, girls come through, guys come through. And the energy, everybody kind of, people kind of, yeah, I was there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was there. So the energy was like, what happens at Freak Nick stays at Freak Nick. That's what the initial vibe was. You, you dig? The initial vibe was what happens here kind of stays here. A lot of the women who would come through were square women back where they were from. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? That was the appeal of it. So girls would come down from like Memphis or Chicago, wherever, and they would be nurses, teachers, dentists, dental assistants or whatever, these were women working square jobs. You come through Freak Nick, everybody, you know, you kind of hook up. You do some freaky for the weekend and then go back home like nothing happened. That was kind of the appeal. You had the normal goody two-shoe type of girls come through. You do what you do and then go back home. And then everybody was like, hey, you talked about it quietly. Man, you know, we really turned up in Freak Nick. And you go back to your normal life. It was that type of vibe. That was kind of, yeah, women went there to kind of get loose to to do something that they wouldn't do normally at home. So everything was, the, it was like a um, an open secret type of vibe there. You yeah? It's kind of an open secret type of vibe. That was the appeal of it. 
So the energy was like, you and your boys go through, five of your homies, you kicking it on Peachtree, five girls roll up, y'all start talking, then y'all pick out who you like, hey, girls roll up on you, hey, where y'all from? Hey, I'm from LA, my homie's from, from Memphis, where y'all from? We, flew, we, we drove down here from South Carolina, where? Who's your homegirl right there? I like how she looked. You know? Then we start picking out. My homeboy want to holler at your girl. Your girl, you like my homie here? Your, your girl, her face is kind of strong. My boy rocks with strong face girls. So everybody kind of designated who they want. All right, where y'all staying? We staying at the whoop de whoop. All right, let's go on back to the whoop de whoop. And that's how it was. It was like a hookup thing. What was I doing there? Shit. <laughs> Kicking it. Oh, I was there. I was at a, at a few of them. Yeah? So it was a hookup thing. So And, and I remember distinctively one thing that was very, that, that really stood out. A lot of the women were women who were teachers and they were librarians and they were nurses and they worked these like very normal jobs. Later on, that's when the the different strippers started coming in and then it became performative. Then they jump on cars, twerking, and then what happened, thirsty niggas start coming through. You know? Thirsty niggas and then all the camcorders start coming out and then instead of, like, you trying to talk to a girl, now you and your homie, you like, hey, you're trying to holler at a girl and then a pack of thirsty niggas, hey, hey, let's see some pussy. You know, it became that type of thing. You couldn't talk to girls no more because packs of thirsty, gang goofy niggas would start showing up with cameras pulling up women's skirts and all of that. So it messed the game up. That started messing the game up. It became too dusty and thirsty. The gang goofy niggas heard about all the stuff that was popping. Then they started rolling up, messing the game up. And then the, the little musty strippers from all these other places, they... They came through twerking on Nissan Altimas and all of this shit. They twerking on cars. and Then it became that. It became too performative. Yeah. But, but here's the thing. A lot of the now, because this documentary is coming out, a lot of the freak Nick aunties are getting nervous. Y'all better understand. A lot of the aunties and your mamas now, some of y'all folks who was born around 97, I see, I got a lot of young folks in here. A lot of y'all were born around 97, 98. Some of y'all asses was conceived at Freak Nick. Your mama says she don't know who your daddy is. She know who that nigga is. She met that nigga on Peachtree. All right? And ain't heard from him since. Yeah? Some of y'all around Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, South Carolina, some of y'all were conceived at Freak Nick. So your mama acts holier than thou now because you didn't have a lot of camcorders back then. What happened at Freak Nick stayed at Freak Nick. So a lot of women would go down there and get real freaky and then go home like nothing happened. All right? Oh, your mama too. Not my mama. Oh, shit. If your mama was in her 20s in the 90s in the southeast of the country somewhere, your mama was somewhere poss possibly pussy popping on a Ford Mustang in 97, all right? So now you got some of the freak Nick aunties who are a little nervous about this documentary because, you know, a lot of them, you know, they weren't hopping on camera per se, but there were a couple of cameras out there. So they're like, that footage is buried. So right here, this one woman right here, this is a freak Nick auntie. She's nervous about the documentary. This woman right here. Hold on. She's talking about the documentary. Hold on. Y'all, I don't know. We might be in trouble. Did y'all see Hulu is about to release a documentary about 94 Freaknik? Yes. Yes. 1994 Freaknik. Yes. They are about to release the documentary. So, um... I'm just now I, I've been to several Freaknik's 94 was one that I attended 
Uh, so and this woman right here, she's older and she's still cute. So I know she was a dime back in the day. I'm, I'm just praying that Jesus be a fence. I'm praying that Jesus just be a big, tall. Oh, don't call on the Lord now, ma'am. Oh, she's calling on the Lord. Oh, she's explaining, ain't she? Auntie is explaining. Oh, no, no, no. She's a deaconess at a, at a church somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. She's explaining. Oh, I'm telling you, a lot of these freak Nick aunties are praying that this footage don't have them in it. And I'm looking at some of the footage, and I'm like, well, hold on. Am I in I'm up here a little nervous, to be honest. Because I saw, I'm looking at one of the commercials, and I was like, wait, that's my homeboy. I saw one of my homies in there, and I'm like, I was hanging out with that dude. So well, they got footage of him. Do they got footage of me in that moment? I'm like, hold on. Let me see what's in this bit. I hope I ain't in this moment. <laughs> but we gonna all be in good trouble. <laughs> so... Auntie is nervous. <laughs> Hold on. Privacy fence. That's my prayer. This Easter, this Good Friday. That's my prayer. So, um, you know, I will say this, though. I will say this. Like, when they would bring out those video cameras and start recording, I immediately removed myself from the um, that situation. I never, ever, ever um, was okay with being recorded out there. So um, hopefully that worked to my benefit, but you know, you never know. You never know. Oh, don't, so, oh, don't explain now, auntie. Auntie explaining. Ain't she explaining hard? The only thing I got is if you see your girl in the documentary, hey man, at least I'm fully clothed. At least all my clothes are on. Oh, that don't mean nothing. That mouth don't have to be fully clothed. <laughs> that's all I got. That's, that's the best I got. But yeah, y'all. They about to put our business out in the street. We about to, some of us might be on TV. Uh -oh. So get your parental controls together. And uh, mm, mm, I don't know, y'all. I don't know. Uh -oh. So, Auntie, sound like they didn't run. She's scared that they didn't probably. Some, did somebody run a train on Auntie? Because you, you had a couple of trains going on. Uh oh. A lot of them don't want to have this footage of them coming out of rooms with three, four niggas. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Uh-oh. Don't explain now. Don't you start explaining now, auntie. It's going to be all right. Man. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Somebody showed a picture of her. Hold on. This is, uh-oh. Wait a, wait a minute. Wait. I didn't see this at first. Look at this. Look at this. Hold on. They got her in the church pew. Shout out to the babies. I don't want to show the babies like that. I just, boy, she's at, she's sitting on the church pew right now. She's a good looking sister too. Oh, I bet she was a dime back in the day. That's why she's playing. I knew she was in the church. I knew she was in the church. Shout out to her. And I didn't, I just saw this picture. I didn't want to show the babies like that. I didn't want to show the babies. I just saw this picture. Oh yeah. She's in the church pews. Uh-oh. Do they have her in there? Hold on. I'm looking at... I don't want to show no pictures of the babies. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Update. Wait, wait, wait. I'm seeing comments. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. just want to say, listen, y'all. I love y'all. I'm looking out for y'all. Hold on. Hold on. I'm looking I'm looking at some stuff in real time. Hold on. Because Auntie is playing. I knew she was playing for a reason. Hold on. Hold on. I am seeing comments like these in my comment section. And I just want to say, listen, y'all, I love y'all. I'm looking out for y'all. Because, listen, this documentary is about the rise and fall of Freaknik. The rise and fall. So that means that, yes, the focus is going to be on 94. Okay. 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 Yeah, I knew she was, a, the way she was playing it, I'm like, okay, she in a church. That's church playing. She's up in somebody's church. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, y'all don't know what y'all mamas them was out there doing. Boy, y'all mama them in the church, and this was them on Peachtree back in the day right here. Y'all mama them was getting it in just like this on Peachtree back in 94. Y'all don't know the stuff y'all mama them was doing. All right? It's all right. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right, ladies. She looks good still. That's a good-looking sister still. So I know back in 94, she was killing the game back in 94. Damn. Yeah. 
But yeah, Freak Nick was, was something. And again, um, you know, I, I want to see how they talk about it and what went down. I'm going to have to find some because I got some pictures from Freak. I got to show some of the pictures that we took on Peachtree. I got some pictures. I see everybody's posting their Freak Nick pictures. I'm going to post some on my gram. Uh, some of the clean ones, some of the clean ones, and, uh, and most of them were clean. And I told y'all that story years ago. Y'all remember back in the Mac Lessons days, I talked about we had a Freak Nick party, and this was back in the day before they had digital cameras. This is when you had to go take the cameras to get developed. And I don't know what was on the, the, the camera. I don't know what was on it, but we went to the, the photo place to get the pictures back from being developed, and they... They were like, hey, you got to talk to the manager. I'm like, we're going to talk to the manager. The manager came through, <laughs> um, sir, we can't develop these type of pictures, sir. You know, you have to take them somewhere else. You, we, we can't develop pictures like this. They wouldn't even develop the pictures. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. So I don't know what was on the damn picture, what was on the film, but back then it was... Something that they couldn't develop. I'm telling you, it was real lit back then. It was lit on another level. But yeah, a lot of the Freak Nick aunties are, are very nervous right now. <laughs> they are very, very nervous. <laughs> and yeah, I get it. So I want to see what this documentary is going to be about. I really want to see this. Yeah. Yeah. They go to the one hour photo in the hood. Yeah, yeah. We went to one. This was on, um, it was on Peachtree. It was in Atlanta, actually. It was some photo place off Peachtree. So you got to, man, get them developed. I, mean, I don't know where the pictures are. This was over 25 years ago. I don't know where that, I don't know where the pictures are, dude. Yeah. Man, but yeah, Freak Nick was, it, it was something. So I, I really want to see this documentary. I really want to see what it's about. Yeah. But anyway, y'all, let me get out of here, man. It, it's been real. We had a long broadcast today. I had to make up for missing the main broadcast through, um, throughout the week. Don't forget, man, um, the new movie, American Maroon. Get the movie, American Maroon. You see in the link below, American-Maroon.com. American-Maroon. Get the film, American Maroon. Great documentary film, great educational piece. If you don't have it, get it now. Um, sign up for FBA Stream. Again, you guys are going to see the, the new um, documentary slash reality show that we did called Museum Life that gives you a day in the life of the Hidden History Museum, showing what we do and some of the, the interesting things that, that, that happen throughout the day. So you'll get to see the daily dealings of the museum. It's a very, very fun piece. Um, we actually show the last event that we did there um, with the, um, the Marsh Museum Mixer. We, we actually did some footage of that. So you guys are going to really enjoy the, um, the piece for the um, museum life. The next comedy event is going to be in a few weeks. We're going to have a comedy event um, in a few weeks at the museum. We're going to start doing them on Wednesdays. We're going to have a comedy night Wednesday night, um, and we're going to do a whole bunch of events at the museum. we got a whole bunch of events coming up, and let me tell y'all something. Y'all want to come to, we're going to have my birthday party there, 4th of July weekend. That's going to be a big one. Y'all need to start saving your flights for that one. Um, we're going to have a big birthday bash at the museum for me. My birthday party is going to be lit, lit, lit for sure. That's going to be off the chain. All right, Fourth uh, of July weekend. That's gonna be a Fourth of July because my birthday is July first. So that whole weekend is gonna be popping. Let me look at the calendar real quick. So you guys need to be getting ready for that. Save your LA trip. Come on through for that. Um, oh yeah, July first is on a Saturday, so it's gonna be real popping. So that's gonna be that's July Fourth weekend, family. It's gonna be so lit at the Hidden History Museum. That's the place you're going to want to be. But before that, y'all need to come to the FBA Expo down in Dallas. That's May 27th, ladies and gentlemen. May 27th, um, FBAExpo.com. 
fbaexpo.com. Get your tickets, get your vending booths, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, man, it's been real. Much respect to you guys, man. I appreciate you guys. Um, again, go to Hidden History Museum. Make a monthly contribution, a recurring contribution. That would be great so that we can keep this history going.